All right, so we're back, different day. Nice and sunny, actually. Uh, when we were here before and it started to rain, it actually rained for like a few hours pretty hard after that. So I'm glad I didn't decide to see the ruins then. But we're back today, it was actually raining just a little bit uh, earlier in the morning. But now it seems like there's a break in the clouds. The sun has come out and uh, the weather says it's not supposed to rain again till the afternoon for maybe a couple more hours. So we came back to the park. The park is open. Gates are open over there, and as a bonus, right over here, hanging out, looks like there are some llamas or alpacas. I don't know, some very cool, very chill looking animals who don't seem to give a shit at all that I am here. They're just hanging out, eating grass, living their lives. Pretty cool, there's a couple more over there. So, we've seen some wildlife, and now I think it's time we go inside and we see, uh, we finally see these ruins. The ruins, the famous ruins of uh, Pumapungo. Let's go. Before we do that, I just want to say real quick thank you very much for watching the video. Click the like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment down below. It's free, it's easy, and it will help the channel grow and help this content reach other YouTube viewers. All right. Back to the video. Right here when you walk into the park, first thing you can see, some of these ruins. Now we're up at sort of like the top of a hill here. Looks like there are some signs here. And uh, oh, it looks like, uh, yeah, some of these are in English. Fantastic. For the construction of Rafael Borja High School inaugurated 1957, two brick and tile ovens were implemented. Kept as a historical testimony passage of the Jesuit community through Pumapongo. And here they are right here. We can go up and take a look real quick. So it's not all ancient ruins here. This is the Jesuit community. That's like 1600s. Ooh, pretty cool. Check it out. actually learned a lot about the Jesuits in uh, South America when we were in Argentina in Cordoba. Major Jesuit presence in Cordoba. I'll link uh, those videos in the description. Here's a little map. Shows off where some of the ruins are. The Curicancha Mayor Temple. Most important religious and political and administrative centers of Tawantinsuyu. Astronomical observatories, they dedicate to the sun. Yeah, now, so this is something that I had learned. Um, of course, the, that the Kanyari, which were the, is like the civilization that was here before the Incas came in and conquered, and that existed actually after the Inca, um, and actually helped to overthrow the Inca, helped the Spanish to overthrow the Inca. They were uh, prodigious astronomers. Wow. Look at this over here. There's like paths, but I feel like we're allowed to walk on the grass here because the signs are over here. Wow, look at this. So I think around the corner there, if you go around the corner of that building, that's where the ruins were. Like, that's where the, the museum is. It's behind this building here. And so we saw these ruins from up in the window we saw this like house here that i guess was recreated yeah reconstruction hypothetical recreation of the akia akiawasi originally built with carved stones that's pretty cool so i guess each one of these little squares here that are laid out in the foundations would have been one of these. I guess the theory is that there would be these foundations of these uncarved stones like this, and then they would have carved stones that they would actually make the house out of. So I mean, imagine like all of these outlines are actually buildings that are made like that. 
Very, very cool. I wonder if we can go down there. I don't see anything blocking us from going down there. Fuck it, we're doing it. I'm going down. Wow. Look at this. So yeah, imagine everything would be all buildings here, not just foundations. Looks like there's little I don't know, like like a water drainage system going down through the middle. One of the security guards just waved me back up. So, okay, apparently we weren't allowed to go down there. But we didn't know. We didn't know and now we know. Still, very cool to see. Kind of wanted to look in that house though. Ground here is a little wet. Gotta be careful not to like slip down the side of a grassy wet hill and eat shit here at the ruins of Pumapungo. It would make for fun content for y'all, but it would not be fun for me. Wow, look at this. Really amazing. Alright, let's go a little bit further, because I think we can go further down the hill and see what's down there. Like I said, up here where the ruins are, we're at the top of the hill, where all the foundations are. And over the other side here, you get a beautiful view, of part of the city. And down there, looks like a recreation of what the gardens would have looked like and how they were growing crops. It's a very cool circular garden. Uh, actually, circular garden like that, quite efficient. I wonder if that is an actual historical recreation of how they uh, they envisioned the gardens to be. But anyway, there's a path that goes down the side here. And uh, it looks like they tiered the hill. And I think this is likely, even though there's like wood steps in it, but this is likely how it was originally set up. Right? Because you're built on the side of a giant hill. You gotta have a nice easy way to get up and down from the garden up to the houses up there. So you would do tiered paths like this to make it easy. To make it easy to haul all of your crops and whatnot from down there up to the houses. Very cool. Right out there outside that gate where those people were waving to me. Uh, that's where we were wandering around yesterday trying to figure out how to get into this place. And now I really feel like an idiot too because like I went back and looked at that part of the video. We were literally standing, we walked right past the gate where, uh, where we needed to go to get into this part. We walked right past it uh, and ended up just exiting back out onto the street and then walking completely around this entire park, all the way around and back to the museum. And it was like 30 seconds after we had seen a map that showed exactly where to go in. Look, I'm not the smartest guy, okay? I'll be honest. 50% of the time, I'm just saying stuff with confidence and it makes me sound like I'm smart, but I'm not. But that's okay, because I know that. And if you know yourself, well, then I guess you can be happy, right? Very cool. This is really, really cool to look back up to and to see all the stones like laid in here to tier this hill so that you can have a path to go up. And of course, like just on the other side of those trees, that's where the river is. The river Tomebamba. So, of course, this spot on a giant hill with a flat area here, right next to a river. That's like the perfect place. Oh, there's a sign over here I want to check out. It's the perfect place to build a settlement like this.
What does our sign say here? It's a tunnel. It's a tunnel. Ooh. Look at this. Which is locked off. We can't go in there. But place of worship and veneration of the prestigious Wakakuna. Related to the Sapan Inca. Which were publicly exhibited during the main religious festivities of the Inca. So, this spot, of course, originally, from the research, the little research that I have done, I think this was originally like a Canary settlement. And when the Inca came in and conquered, they basically just took it over. Because honestly, if you already have a settlement and it's in the right place, you know, hill, flatland, river, you know, why, why, why build a new one yourself? You just take this one over. It's what the Spanish did in a lot of places too. When they came in and conquered in uh, Santiago de Chile, for example, where we were in the Plaza de Armas, link to that video in the description. The Spanish came in, it was already an Inca like plaza in the middle of a settlement. And so they just took it over. This is ours now. Thank you. Basically the situation. Now interestingly here in, uh, in Cuenca, Tomebamba, when the Spanish did arrive in many parts of Ecuador actually, the Inca had already basically like scorched earth, burned down a lot of settlements and destroyed everything so that the Spanish would not be able to, uh, to use them. And one of the real interesting things about Cuenca specifically was the Spanish, they had this, uh, you know, long-standing myth of uh, El Dorado, the golden one, right? The city, a city of gold where all the riches of some great American empire here in the Americas would be. And that was like a major motivator for a lot of the conquistadors who came here. And Cuenca actually was theorized, or, well, it wasn't Cuenca at the time, of course, pre-Spanish, so it was Tomebamba, and before that it was Huapoledig, Huapolendig, I might get that wrong. If it's wrong, I'll put the right one in the subtitles, I swear. But basically, because when the Spanish arrived here, like, a lot of it had just been destroyed, and a lot of other, like, Inca settlements in Ecuador, the, um, the Inca had, had destroyed them, gone like scorched earth. And so the Spanish theorized that this Cuenca may have been one of the potential sites that they thought was the city of gold, El Dorado. And that the Inca had just like basically taken all the gold, destroyed the city and like took off probably further south down into Peru, a lot closer to like the center of their, uh, of their empire. Here is a calendar, religious calendar, Agricola. Together with the domestication of plants, the development of technologies, Andean society, structured social systems with an economic agricultural base. Territories are managed according to religious principles and natural conditions, variables of climate, soil, and irrigation. Oh, that makes sense. So they centered their religion basically around the agricultural um, calendar, which <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Very cool. All right, we're getting close to the garden down here. Really want to come down and see this. Uh, go around here, or we can go down here. Let's go around here. I see a sign down at the end here. I want to read, see what it is. Now, when we were in that museum the other day, I really thought that the upstairs was the whole thing was just going to be dedicated to like explaining, you know, what this was basically this site which would have been cool, but I think actually what we got was kind of cooler, right? It was like a whole ethnography of all the different um, like indigenous ethnic groups that um, existed and still exist today in different parts of Ecuador. I think that's really cool. Looks like these signs are just, because this is like a little botanical garden, a botanical garden with the street right there. But still, a, bit, a little botanical garden, it's, it's nice. I mean, you're in a city, you know, what are you gonna do? When you're in a city, you gotta find the green space where you can, right? 
It's actually quite nice in here. It's very cool. A little muddy because of the rain. That's okay. And each one of these uh, little plaques has a little QR code, which is kind of cool. You can see more information about each one of these plants. So if you ever come here and you really want to know, you can get your phone out and you can scan it. All right, here we are. The garden, wow, okay. This is very cool. So they have actual crops growing here. That would be, I would imagine, the actual crops that would have been growing at the time, or as close as they can, as close as they can replicate, you know, in modern times. Of course, plants evolve. And like, for example, I think these are potatoes. The potatoes we have now are probably different from the potatoes they had back then. These look like pumpkins or gourds of some kind, I would say. I don't know what those are over there. What do you think these are? Comment down below, any horticulturists or botanists, if you think you know what these are. But these I'm pretty sure are pumpkins. I've seen pumpkins before. Gourds, yeah, actually there's a rotting one right there. It's a gourd of some sort. Corn, clearly. This, hmm, this I wonder. This is interesting. I don't know what this is. It's possible they're growing flowers like in amongst, just to attract pollinators, you know, bees and whatnot. These are peppers. You can see them right there, actually. There's a really good one right there. Let's see. Red peppers, delicious looking red peppers. These, I'm not sure. How much you want to bet one of these signs tells us what everything is? It's more fun to guess. These also, not sure. Not sure what they are. Oh. Uh, chakra, the original names of planting systems in the Ecuadorian Andes have been lost. Nevertheless, the general designation chakra of Quichua origin still exists. Systems that favor a variety of crops in the same plot prepared and irrigated by canals that flood the earth, taking advantage of the rain cycles. Oh, it permits the interaction of plants that favor each other, while demands for soil nutrients are lower. That is very smart. The way we do it in sort of like, you know, Western, modern agriculture is basically like, <laughs> plant, plant a big field, plant corn in that field. It's interesting here that, you know, different nutrients are needed for different uh, plant types. And of course, I would imagine they would like rotate. You would probably have to rotate, right? You couldn't just plant corn in the same spot all the time because it would eat up all the nutrients that are needed for corn in that soil until eventually that soil is just like barren and you have to like, um, you know, you have to like treat it and let it let it go foul for a season or two. These are, I think, tomatoes. Pretty cool. Maybe tomatoes. I don't know. They look like tomatoes. Beans. Some sort of bean. Oh, they do have signs here, actually, inside each one of these. Ashipa choclo. It's a plant native to Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. It's cool. We're in the cornfields here. This is really cool. And like, look at it down here. You can see the ruins up on top of that hill. How cool that is. I mean, imagine like, you gotta imagine that, but with like all the buildings up on top of the hill. And not just there too, like, this little park, there are ruins that are preserved in this park. But I've noticed in other places in the neighborhood, in just like tiny little corners of a neighborhood, there'll be some ruins that are preserved. So like, it wasn't like it was just 
this hill with stuff on top and the garden down here and that's it. There was other stuff around and there are other ruins that just, you know, weren't as well preserved. So I would imagine probably on the other side of the river as well and out that way, you know, out in the distance all around, there would be more ruins like this that just didn't get preserved. And these are the ones that were preserved. So you can sort of see just like a little window into what it was like. Okay, now we can find out what these plants are. Or we could, if our Spanish was better. Very cool. Walk back around this way and see what more we can see around here. It is said that Huayna Capac, born in Tomebamba, ordered the construction of a cucha or lagoon in honor of the god Tixi Wiracucha. For this, took advantage of the slopes of this area. Oh, that, that should probably be... Yeah, it took advantage of the slopes of the area and the rising of the Tomebamba River. Oh. So the little lagoon here has been rebuilt, rebuilt of course. This is a reconstruction, but there would have been a lagoon here when the river right across the little ridge there would have rose. It would spill over into the lagoon and then when it lowers again, the water would stay here in the lagoon. And you get all kinds of plants and wildlife and little ducks hanging out. Very cool. That's up there where those big clay ovens were, the Jesuit uh, style clay ovens where we were. We've come all the way down the hill now. And over here, there's something else. I don't know what's over here. Let's find out. Oh, fauna. Oh, there's going to be animals over here. Yo. Fauna and El Incario. Time of the Incas that cultivated the area, there was a garden of gold and silver as existed in the royal houses of kings, where there were many herbs and flowers of diverse types, lesser plants, large trees, animals, small and large, wild and domesticated creatures such as snakes, large lizards and tiny ones, snails, butterflies, birds, other large fowl, flying fowl. Very cool. So based on historic context, they've recreated this garden. Now I imagine there were not like wooden guardrails and things. I mean, maybe there were. Maybe there were like wooden doors. But probably not with like modern metal door handles and locks. But it's still cool that they've recreated like a little sort of an homage to like what the Inca have. And so, yeah, we have some animals here. I did not think we were going to see animals. I'm pretty psyched. Wow. Check out Birdie. Looks like a chicken, actually. Guaya, guaya, guacamayo, guacamayo y la serpiente. He does have a very chicken-like look to him, his head at least. Very cool. I don't see the serpiente. I imagine putting a snake in here. If it was big enough, it would be a bad idea because he would eat the bird. And if it was small enough, the bird would probably eat the snake. So maybe, maybe there's no snake in there. What else is in here? Oh, look at this. Those are macaws. Blue and gold macaws. Now, I know a little bit about macaws because there's, uh, there's a YouTube channel and a Twitch stream that I really enjoy watching. Alveus Sanctuary is a Twitch streamer named Maya Higa who like started this uh, she raised like I don't know five hundred six hundred thousand dollars while she was Twitch streaming and used it instead of to like buy a giant uh, you know mansion and well not that you could buy a giant mansion in the United States for five hundred thousand dollars but she used the money that she raised uh, being a very 
popular Twitch streamer to make a huge animal sanctuary, which is really cool. And uh, I guess I'll link the channel to the Alveus YouTube channel down in, uh, and Twitch down there. But anyway, I've learned about macaws from her and from Alveus. So thank you, Alveus. Thank you, Maya Higa. Blue and gold macaws. Now, one thing I know from watching those that macaws like this, people like to keep them as pets. And uh, it's a terrible, terrible idea because they're super loud and like very violent. They are very temperamental. Their beaks can literally rip your finger off and break bone. They use those beaks to like crack open nuts, like walnuts and almonds and the shells of nuts. And uh, they live to be like 70 years old. So basically, you're having like an angry temperamental thing in your house that like doesn't really like you and uh, is gonna bite your fingers off and it lives for 70 years, so don't get one of those. A yellow crowned Amazon. Huh, interestingly enough, they've got one of these, I think, at the uh, Animal Sanctuary Alveus as well. Pretty cool. Oh, and also, they're very loud. Parrots and macaws and things like that, they're super loud. They squawk, they scream, they make tons of noise, and they poop all over your house, and they live for like 70 years, so. Don't get one as a pet. Just, just come to a place like this, some sort of animal sanctuary or, you know, a place like this, an aviary, a professional aviary, and come look at them. Orange winged parrot, Laura Amazona Alinarana. Parrots are very cool. They're just chilling here, but don't get them as a pet. Canary winged parakeet. Yeah, I mean, listen to these little guys. They're so loud. They're just insanely loud. Do you want one of these in your house? making all this noise for 60 or 70 years? I don't. But I do want to come here and visit them for about one minute. So there's some other birds in here too, walking around on the ground. Pretty cool. Oh, look at this guy. Black-chested buzzard eagle. Okay, that guy's serious. He's looking right at us. Very serious. It's a handsome gentleman. Oh, there's two of them. Wow. Very cool looking. This is a welcome surprise. I thought we were just coming to see the ruins of Pumapongo. And we came and saw a bunch of really cool birds, too. Very cool. I want to zoom in on these guys, but I'm afraid with the uh, the grate that's here, if I zoom in, it's just going to lose focus. Let's, let's try it. Well, I guess, yeah, we can see him. Cool. What do we have here? More parakeets, red masked parakeets. These guys are a lot quieter than the other parakeets. You see him there? Yeah, when you zoom in, the grate kind of gets in the way. It sort of focuses more on the grate than it does on the birds. Got one of them right here. Right here, chilling. Actually, that's, uh... This might be something different. This is perhaps a white-eyed parakeet or a scarlet-fronted parakeet. There's so many different kinds of birds. It's really amazing. Blue-headed parrots. Red billed parrots. Super cool. Oh, look at this guy. A savannah hawk. Yeah. Well, there's two of them in here. There's this other one. That one right there that's giving us the butt. That's the savannah hawk. 
And then the other one is a variable hawk. He's back there in the dark, standing on one foot. And all of this bird content. This is gonna be a long video. We may have to split this into two videos. I didn't, wasn't expecting all of this bird content. More blue and yellow, blue and gold macaws. And a scarlet macaw also. I don't see the scarlet one. Maybe hiding in here somewhere. Over there, maybe? No, I don't see him. Could be hiding. Could be back in the indoor part, maybe. Chilling out or getting medical treatment or something like that. And uh, a bearded guan. Oh, that's what we were looking at at the beginning. Didn't see the sign here, but this is what we were seeing. The bearded guan. Get a close, closer look at the bearded guan. Very cool. I don't know how well this came across on the video, just because the, you know, it's an aviary, there's cages, um, you know, the, the mesh in front. Hopefully you guys got a chance to look at all of those very cool birds. I thought it was really cool. Oh yeah, here. Water, an essential and energizing principle of life inspired its sacredness in Andean man. For this reason, their myths of origin are linked to rivers and lagoons. A couple of ducks hanging out over there. I don't think they're part of the aviary. Those are just uh, freelance ducks. Take a little walk down here through a little patch of flora. Like being in the jungle right here in the middle of the city. Pretty cool. Oh, this is really cool. Look, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely glad we came back here to see, uh, to see the ruins, of course, but also, I mean, we ended up with a major bonus. Got to see, like, little mini botanical garden sections with plants, to see this beautiful little lagoon that they've recreated on the side of the hill where the ruins are, ducks playing. Even little pigeons wandering around, because, you know, it's nice. If you were a pigeon and you lived in the city and you had a cha choice between, like, being out in the city somewhere or being here by this beautiful lagoon, what would you choose? Obviously, you'd choose this, right? Right. Got to see the aviary, all those super cool birds. And like I mentioned before, the museum itself Got a duck under that. Oh, this crazy bug. I don't know what kind of bug that is. Anybody in the comments know what kind of bug that is? Tell me. Yeah, even the, uh, the museum itself was a nice surprise. Like I said, I thought we were going to get a museum that was just all about this all about this site and what we got was actually something something far more interesting right we got an entire ethnography of different indigenous or indigenous um, ethnic groups of Ecuador the different regions of Ecuador that's really cool that's definitely better all right look I think we've seen everything that we came here to see. But now that I think about it... Okay, see? They're going off. Oh, there's the scarlet macaw. Look, 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 look. Yeah, look at these guys. They're loud, too. Once again, 
you don't want to have these things as pets. You really don't. Look at that scarlet macaw. Super cool. These guys. They're so loud. <laughs> so, so loud. Alright, we're leaving, we're leaving. We're leaving. They're too loud. Can you imagine having that in your house for 70 years? Ay, ay, ay. I head over this way. Oh, this looks like this is a dead end. This is a dead end. We're gonna head back <laughs> past the loud, angry birds. And uh, I think we're gonna call it. I think we're gonna call it. What I was saying before, we were interrupted by the parrots <laughs> bickering and fighting, and before we got to see the scarlet macaw, which was actually very cool. I'm glad we saw the scarlet macaw. But what I was gonna say um, is, I really think. I really. Gracias. I really think this is gonna have to be two videos. There's just too much here. With all the museum that we saw, all the uh, amazing exhibits about ethnography, and also like all of the extra stuff that we saw out here in the ruins with the aviary and the little botanical garden. Yeah, this is gonna end up being two videos, which you probably already know now because you're likely watching the end of, uh, of the second video. Well, I hope you enjoy both of them. And I am now going to walk up this large set of stairs and get the heck out of here. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the last video. And I hope you stick around because we're going to have a lot more videos from here in Cuenca.